In today's video, we're going to review the ASI 533 monochrome camera, which came out earlier this year, and it's done a pretty awesome job. I've been using it for the last six months, and that's given me enough time to really get a firm understanding of just how well the camera performs. We're going to start off and talk about the camera specs so you know what you're in for, and then we'll take a look at some of the photos I've taken over the last six months so you can see what's possible. All right, so let's start off on ZWO's website and we can see that the ASI 533 is a monochrome camera and it's currently retailing for about $1,000. They do give you the option to purchase this with a filter wheel and a set of one and a quarter inch filters. However, to be honest, I think you're better off investing in some two inch filters instead. Those are gonna be larger and more expensive, but they will be future proofed. So regardless of the camera or the telescope you buy down the road, they should work great. Whereas the one and a quarter inch, they're gonna save you some money, but eventually you might see vignetting and some other problems. And that is one thing to consider because if you're buying a monochrome camera, you will need a set of LRGB filters and then a set of narrowband. That's gonna definitely increase your costs, not to mention the cost of the filter wheel as well. And while ZWO does say that this is an entry level camera for deep space astrophotography, I think if you're really new to the hobby, the filters might be a little bit confusing at first, but thankfully there's plenty of great YouTube videos that will help you through that process. And I do think a monochrome sensor is a great place to start if you're willing to put in the time and the effort to understanding how those filters work both in the field and during post-processing. And if we continue to scroll down here, we can see that the Sony sensor here is back illuminated, which is really good for Astro. And most importantly, this is a one inch sensor. And because this is a one inch square sensor, it's effectively gonna multiply any focal length by a factor of three. Therefore, if I use my small red cat telescope, which only has a focal length of 250 millimeters, I'm effectively shooting at a focal length of 750 millimeters with this camera sensor. Now I know there's gonna be comments saying that's not how it works, but fundamentally, if you're a beginner, that's the way you wanna think about it. And really what's just changing is that your field of view is much smaller. And I go into this in a lot further detail in some other videos if you wanna learn more, but again, the main benefit here is that if you have a small one inch sensor, now you're getting more zoom with whatever telescope you put on there. The resolution is 3000 roughly by 3000 pixels. I will say that that could be a bit higher, but all things considered, I haven't really noticed any quality loss when I zoom or crop into my images. For those that are into the real technical specs, you can see the rest here, including the pixel size, the quantum efficiency, the full well capacity and more. Before we continue on though, I just wanted to reiterate that the one inch sensor is really the most important thing to consider with this camera. And to be honest, that's really the only problem I had with this camera is that every photo I take is a square. And as a YouTuber, that makes it very difficult to incorporate into my videos because a square does not translate very well to the 16 by nine ratio. And that would be something to consider if you are gonna be making a lot of videos and including your photos, the one inch square sensor might be a bit of a problem but for everybody else, I think it'll work just fine. Another important factor with this camera is that it has zero amp glow, unlike a lot of their other sensors out there. Therefore, I don't have to worry about dark frames anymore because as you can see here on the right, whenever I take a photo, there's no annoying flashlight pattern or amp glow in my images, so I don't have to take darks and include them in my stack. Now I'm sure people would still recommend taking those just so you have them and you can calibrate, but I'm lazy and my photos look fine without them, so I'm not gonna bother. But I think this is a good selling point if you are a beginner, because now this is just one less thing you have to worry about when you're taking your photos. Because again, let's say you have the 294 or the 1600, you're gonna have amp glow in your photos that you'll need to calibrate out, otherwise they'll ruin your final image. But with the 533, you're not gonna have any amp glow to worry about. If you're watching this video and you're still using a DSLR, but you're thinking about upgrading, then one thing you should be aware of is the cooling system that's built in. Pretty much all the dedicated astro cameras have a cooling system and that's critical because that's gonna keep the noise and everything else lower in your photos, giving you cleaner final images, especially during those warm summer months. And I never really appreciated just how important this cooling is until I was shooting in the desert during the summer with my DSLR because that sensor would get so hot, I could clearly see more noise in my photos than I would during the winter. And again, every dedicated astro camera has this feature for the most part, so it's not anything special to the 533. Just something to be aware of though, that this will really increase the quality of your images. And that's really all there is to talk about in terms of the specs. It's got a USB 3.0 port, which will connect to your laptop, or I'd recommend the ASI Air. 
And then through the ASI Air, you can control everything, including the gain or the ISO of the camera, however you want to think about that, the shutter speed, the amount of photos, etc. And I've got plenty of videos here on YouTube and over on HowTube that will show you how to use this camera on the ASI Air. The final thing to consider is the connections to your telescope. This can actually be very difficult if you're a beginner, so you'll want to make sure you familiarize yourself with these various diagrams before you go any further, and also consider if you're going to be using a filter wheel, which I'd recommend for this monochrome sensor. All right, now that we've made it through all that, let's take a look at some of the photos I've captured over the last six months with the 533, and then we'll finish up with a little tutorial. Some of the photos that you're looking at were taken here in Port Angeles, Washington, where I'm currently living, and that has a fair amount of light pollution. But with the help of the narrowband filters, it cuts right through all that, and you can get some really nice photos. But recently, I've been going down to Kanab, Utah every month to teach some astrophotography workshops, and because we're out there under a really dark sky, now I can use the RGB filters to take beautiful photos of the various nebula and galaxies. And now that you've seen some of my photos, I thought we'd do a very brief detour and take a look at some of the photos that my students have captured during those workshops. These were not necessarily taken with the 533, but I just wanted to showcase how well they're doing. Alright, now that we saw some of those great photos from my workshop students, I thought we'd finish up the review and then get into the tutorial portion of the video. To recap, I think the ASI 533 is a great camera whether you're a beginner or an advanced shooter. The 1 inch square sensor has pretty much a 3 times magnification for any focal length. So for those of you that want to have a lightweight portable setup like I do, this is the perfect camera to pair with that and I think you'll be really impressed by the final images. Not to mention the fact that you don't have to necessarily worry about dark frames anymore because there's zero amp glow, especially when you look at some of the bad amp glow coming from the 294 or the 1600 or a lot of the other cameras, honestly. Another feature of the 533 is that you can control it entirely from your smartphone or tablet using the ASI Air, and that's something I'd recommend everybody do to make your life easier. Of course, you don't need to use the ASI Air to control this camera. There's a bunch of free programs for your computer like Nina, which can do everything for you. And one of my students in the last workshop, Ben, he was showing me all kinds of crazy stuff you can do in Nina. So that might be something you might want to look into. My final review on the ASI 533 is that this is going to be perfect if you're looking for an inexpensive monochrome camera that can be paired with a small telescope like the Red Cat or the Radiant Raptor or something else. Because with the three times magnification, you can get really a lot of zoom with not the biggest telescope out there. And for that reason, I think this is the perfect option for beginners or even more advanced shooters. And now I want to show you my favorite photo that I've taken with the 533, and that's this photo of the Orion Nebula. This was captured back in October in Kanab, Utah with the 533, my Red Cat telescope, and the ZWO AM5 mount, which has been performing really well during the last few months. All right, before we get to the tutorial portion, there's one other thing I need to mention. And that is the fact that almost all the photos you've seen today have been both captured and edited by my girlfriend. I had nothing to do with it. She got really into Astro over the last six months. In fact, when this camera arrived, she wanted to try that out along with the AM5. So I let her run with everything. And with very minimal help from myself, she's been going out there, doing the polar alignments, getting the guiding, figuring out the meridian flip, and much more. And that just goes to show you, you don't need to have years and years of experience to take the photos that you're seeing today you can still get amazing results with a good camera like this, the AM5, and a decent telescope. Okay, there's one last thing I wanted to do before the tutorial, and that is read just a little quote here from this book, Star Lore of All Ages. This actually came out over 100 years ago, but there's a lot of really interesting information regarding the constellations. So if you're into the night sky at all, this might be something to look into. You can find it as a PDF for free online, but I went out and got a first edition copy just to have it. And we're going to be reading a little story here from the uh, Orion Nebula chapter here. Here on page 286, we can see a photo of the Orion Nebula that was taken over 100 years ago, which is crazy to think about. And that's why I wanted to include this segment in the video, because I read this today, and it really drove home an important point. If we were to go back 100 years ago and show these astronomers the photos that we've all taken, they would be blown away by what was possible. And I think it's pretty incredible now that the average person with some fairly modest gear 
can take these beautiful breathtaking photos of all these various galaxies and nebula. And if we go to page 287, we can see here that nowhere else in the heavens is the architecture of a nebula so clearly displayed. It is an unfinished temple whose gigantic dimensions, while exalting the imagination, proclaim the omnipotence of its builder. But though unfinished, it is not abandoned. The work of creation is proceeding within its precincts. There are stars apparently completed, shining like gems just shot from the hands of the polisher, and around them are masses, eddies, currents, and swirls of nebulous matter yet to be condensed, compacted, and constructed in a sun's. It is an education in the nebular theory of the universe merely to look at this spot with a good telescope. If we do not gaze at it long and wistfully and return to it many times with unflagging interest, we may be certain that there is not the making of an astronomer in us. And I think that quote really hits home because I know for myself, I've been trying to photograph the Orion Nebula for years now. And every time I think I got it looking really nice, I always want to go back and do even better. And my most recent photo is definitely my best yet. And that's going to do it for the review portion of today's video. Next, we're going to go through and do a quick processing tutorial. And we'll take a look at some actual images from the 533. Welcome back to the video. We're now going to do a quick processing tutorial for the ASI 533 monochrome camera. We'll start off in Deep Sky Stacker and stack our photos. All of these images today were actually captured by my girlfriend while I was teaching during the recent workshop in Kanab, and I think she did a really nice job, but we'll see here just how well the data looks once we're all done. And it looks like she captured H alpha and then sulfur. So just two filters, but even with just two filters, we can still turn this into a full color photo. One of the downsides of using Deep Sky Stacker is that there's no way to really stretch the data very effectively, and that can make it hard to see if you even have anything visible at all. This would be one reason why you might want to consider trying the ASI Studio instead, just to even see your data better. As you can see right here, it automatically stretches the data, and you can see what you're working with. Anyway, what we're going to do now in Deep Sky Stacker is rate all of the photos. And you're probably better off doing this filter by filter to be safe. So we can start off with just the H alpha images and then check all of those. And then we go over to the left where it says register checked pictures. And this is another word for rating the photos. It's going to give it a score from low to high. That way you can see which photos are blurry and which ones are sharp. For this, we're always going to go to the advanced tab, adjust the star detection threshold slider until it finds a reasonable amount of stars. 138 sounds fine. And then we'll see how many uh, scores it can give us for our images. Once we've done that for H alpha, we'll repeat the process for sulfur. And the reason I'm breaking this up by filter is because if you're doing a whole different set of images with different brightness values, it can really throw off the score and give you wrong values. Again, it's better to do this filter by filter just to be safe. There we go. We have all of our H alpha images scored. Then I can change the file scheme here until we're looking at sulfur up top. I'm going to hit uncheck all on the left, that way nothing is checked, and then select all my sulfur images next. We'll right click and check all the sulfur, and then we'll go through and do the same thing. We'll compute the number of detected stars to see how many it finds. 141 sounds fine to me. Another thing I should have mentioned is that we're turning off the button for stack after registering. That way it doesn't actually stack anything just yet. So make sure that is turned off. And then we'll go through and rate the sulfur photos next. As I mentioned earlier, we only have two filters today, sulfur and hydrogen alpha. But that's fine. You don't necessarily need three to get a color photo, especially when you're doing narrowband. There we go. We have now scored all the sulfur photos as well. Then I can click on the score tab, and it's going to go through and rate these from the lowest to the highest score. I just want to make sure that when I look at the low scores, they're actually still sharp. If they're blurry, then I can always right click and erase them from the disk. That way they don't have to get included with our stack later on. But look at this here. This image has a score of 540, but there's clearly streaking stars. I don't know why I got such a high score here, but I'm going to remove it from my computer. This is why you really want to make sure when you come through here and just double check that the values are actually correct. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're actually pretty far off. Now that I've gone through and verified all my images are sharp, I need to choose a reference frame. This will be the photo where everything gets lined back up to for the stacking. And as we discussed earlier, 
there's no good way to really stretch the data here in Deep Sky Stacker. So what I'd recommend you do is open up your photos in ASI Studio instead, where it will automatically stretch the data. And then just go through these photos until you find one that has a composition you really like. And we'll use that as our reference frame. Well, before we go any further, I should mention that using this software is a great way to see what photos are actually sharp or not. Look at this. This image has some clouds blowing through. And Deep Sky Stacker, we'd have no way to know that that was a problem. But because this is stretching the data for us, we can tell that some of these photos don't look all that great. And if I look at the file name here, this is sulfur, 23, 22, 21 doesn't look so bad. Clearly there's some clouds blowing through at night. And that means I need to go through and probably remove these as well. I go to 22, 23, and 24. That's why I recommend everybody, if you don't have it already, download ASI Studio. It's a free program for your computer. It's just another way to make sure that the data you're working with is actually good. Now that I found out those photos are bad here in Deep Sky Stacker, I'll remove them. And I'll continue on trying to find one that actually looks pretty good in terms of the composition. I think we'll go with H alpha number 13 today. I kind of like that right there. So that means I go back to Deep Sky Stacker, look for H alpha number 13, then I'll right click on it and choose use as reference frame. Now there should be a little asterisk next to the score that indicates this is our reference photo where everything gets aligned to. For those that aren't using the 533, you might want to take some flat frames, dark frames, and bias frames and include them in your stack as well. But as I've shown you today, you really don't need to worry about dark frames with this particular camera, or bias, or flats in my case. So I don't really have any calibration frames today, and we'll see just how well the final image turns out. Okay, so right now I have all of my sulfur photos still selected, but none of the H-alpha. That's important. And with just my sulfur photos selected, none of the H-alpha, I'll click on Stack Check Pictures on the left, go to the Recommended Settings. Since I have over 20 light frames, I can do Sigma Clipping. That looks fine. I have three hours worth of data. And this is something that I should mention. You know, when you're doing narrowband work, you need a lot of time to invest in your photos. If you only have like an hour or two's worth of data for sulfur or oxygen, your photos are still going to be very grainy. That's because when you're working with narrowband, you're just getting a very narrow slice of light and you're not really seeing most of the other spectrum. Therefore, if you really want to take your astrophotography photos to the next level when it comes to narrowband, try spending an entire week just capturing data with one filter, then move on to the next filter the next week, assuming you actually get plenty of clear nights. Okay, here we go. It's finished stacking and we can see that there's this really weird black bar. That's just because we didn't line up the photos as closely as we could have from night to night and we lost quite a bit. That's something you want to try to work around yourself when you're out there. In other words, if this was going to be a reference star there, try to get it in the exact same place night after night. That way you don't have to really lose all this extra cropping here along the edging. Now that this photo has finished saving, I'm going to navigate to that directory and we see autosave.tiff. I'm going to rename this to sulfur32 bits because it's a 32-bit file. Then I'll cut this photo out and paste it into a TIFF folder, which I've already created. That way I can stay organized. Next, I'll go back up to Registering and Stacking. I'll click Uncheck All on the left, and I'll repeat this process for the H-alpha images again. So I've deselected all the sulfur. Now I'm going to select just the H-alpha. There we go. I'll click on Stack Check Pictures. I only have about two hours of data for H-alpha. That's the best we can do though. And then we'll run this through. Deep Sky Stacker has finished processing the H alpha. And because it creates an autosave automatically, we'll go back to our directory here. We'll rename autosave to H alpha 32 bits. And we'll put that in the TIFF folder as well. So now we have H alpha and sulfur ready to go. Then I can close out of Deep Sky Stacker. We're done for today. And we're going to head over next to PixInsight, actually. I know I normally use Photoshop for this process, but I want to show you how easy it can be using PixInsight. We'll start off by going to File, Open, and we'll grab our Sulfur and H-Alpha photos. Thankfully, there's a very easy way to stretch this data. All we need to do is hit Control or Command A, 
on both images. And there we go. We can see all the beautiful data that was captured right here. Unfortunately, the data has not been officially stretched yet. And if we go up to our histogram transformation window here, this is under process, all processes, histogram transformation. If we click where it says no view selected, we can see that the data is still just this very narrow spike. It actually has not been stretched. Therefore, we might as well just do that right now. And we can do that by going up to process, all processes, screen transfer function. With a little bit of effort, this isn't too hard to wrap your mind around, although it is still kind of weird. For example, there's these triangular and square buttons, which don't make a lot of sense from a user's point of view. But basically what we're gonna do is drag the little triangle down here from the screen transfer function. We drag that triangle down to here where we see the little hourglass icon and let go. Then for whatever reason, we click on the square button because that makes a lot of sense. And unfortunately, it didn't quite do what I wanted it to do for some reason. So I'm going to hit Control Z. I'll make sure my H alpha image is selected. I've got H alpha here as well. Then I'll click the square. There we go. Now we can see the data has been stretched, but the image went pure white. Therefore, what we need to do is click on the nuclear button here in our screen transfer function window. And now the data has finally been stretched. I realize that is not intuitive at all but this is just something you pick up after using the program a few times. Now we need to repeat that step for sulfur as well. And I think we can actually just hit the square this time and make sure we actually have the image highlighted here. There we go. Looks like that was now stretched as well. So with our two stretched photos, we're ready to create a color image. And this is very easy to do inside of PixInsight. For that, we'll go up to Process, All Processes, and we're looking for the LRGB combination. Even if you're doing narrowband, we're still going to use this particular tool. When you get the LRGB combination window up, you can choose from L, R, G, or B in terms of your colors. So for this, let's put H alpha on the red color channel just by clicking this box and choosing it. I'm going to put sulfur on green. I want to put sulfur on blue as well. For the luminance, because the H alpha is so bright, I'm going to choose H alpha for that. So what we've done is map H alpha to both the luminance and the red color channels, and then sulfur to both green and blue. If we go to the channel weights, we can turn up or down the values associated with each one of those color channels. For example, I probably don't need a weight of one, for the luminance, I'm able to just do like 0.6. It really doesn't matter. We'll just try something and see how it goes. When you're ready, we'll click on the circular button to create our new image. And there it is. There is our new color photo. Looks pretty good. If I think it looks a little bit weird though, maybe I can try lowering the luminance even further to maybe just 0.25. And if I click the circular button again, that will create a new image. I'm going to compare those both side by side. I think uh, they both look pretty good, but it's up to you. You can always do whatever you want. I think we'll go with the 0.25 one now right here. And you can see there that that was a very easy way to stretch the data and create a color photo. Next, we're going to use a few tools from Russell Croman. And what we're going to do is just kind of look at the image right now. And we see that there's still a bit of grain, although not as much as I would have thought. So if my image is still a bit grainy, I'll go to Process all processes. And we have a plugin here from Russell Croman called Noise Exterminator. This is a paid plugin, but I think it's well worth the money. And the way this works is you're just going to drag the triangle over to your image. It's now going to go through and do a really nice job of removing all the grain from your photo. I don't know how well you can see this in the video, but here's our before and after. It's pretty subtle actually in this particular photo, but normally there's a really pronounced difference and the noise exterminator does a fantastic job of removing the grain without distorting the photo and the stars, which is critical. So I think if you're looking for a great way to reduce the noise in your photos, then noise exterminator is some of the best money you can spend for that feature. Another plugin from Russell Croman available here is called Star. 
Exterminator. And I've been going back and forth between this one and the free Starnet 2, which I normally recommended, but I actually think Star Exterminator, at least here inside of PixInsight, does a really good job for both narrowband and RGB images. So what I'm gonna do is check the box for generate star images. And then after I've done generate star image, I'm just gonna drag the triangle over to the photo and it will begin to create a starless photo. And this will take quite a while on Windows, usually up to 10 minutes, but it seems to be much faster on Mac. So I'll pick back up with you when this is complete. That took a really long time, but at least it's finally done. And we can now see that photo right here without any stars whatsoever. It looks pretty darn awesome. Now what I'll do is go up to File, Save As, and I'll call this Sadar Cleaned because we ran Noise Exterminator on it. And we also ran Star Exterminator on it as well. And I'm gonna save this as a 16-bit TIFF file to make it easier to process. And I'll hit OK. Now I don't necessarily want to have just the starless photo. So if I undo this, we bring the stars back and I can call this, if we save it, just Sadar Cleaned Stars. That way you have both the stars and a starless photo. And I will say that during my recent workshop, one of my students, Ben, he got pics in sight and within like two days, he was already a master of it. And one thing he found is that there's a great way to do a star reduction and incorporate your stars here inside of PixInsight using some of the more advanced processes. However, I don't remember off the top of my head what those were, so you might wanna check the comments down below. I'm sure somebody will know some good ways to do this and they'll probably include it down there. Anyway, I'm gonna head over to Photoshop for the rest of this workflow and then we'll call it a day. Now that I've got both photos opened up inside of Photoshop, I'll take probably the starless photo Hit Controller Command A, Controller Command C to copy that. Paste it in as a new layer on top of my stars image. So I'll call this one Starless. And then this one I will rename to Stars. There we go. And that looks pretty impressive, I'd say. I mean, if you think back to our original photo, it was just kind of black because it was so dark. And now we have all this amazing detail with no signs of amp glow and really no problems whatsoever. It looks great. My main concern right now is it's just all a shade of red. It looks a little bit boring. So why don't we do something special here for the colors? And this is a technique I covered in a previous video on color masks. If you have Raya Pro and Instamask, this is very easy to do. You're gonna click on either red, green, or blue. I'm gonna click on red, and then click on the brights one button right here. That creates a layer mask that is based on the red color channel, which we see right here. Anyway, with this red layer mask created, I'll click on select. Then I go up top here and I can add anything I want to, but I'll do a levels today. Again, I have a full separate tutorial for this where I go through it a lot slower, which you can find here on YouTube. Anyway, now that I have a levels adjustment with my red color channel right here as a layer mask, watch what happens. If I change this to the red color channel up top here, I can move my sliders around and change the color balance of the photo. I can make it more or less red in the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. And then once that looks pretty good, I can turn it on and off to see the difference. Then I can go down to the green color channel, and then I can move these sliders around as well. Feel free to adjust this any way that you think looks good. Then we'll go down to the blue color channel and do the same thing. Just moving our sliders left and right until we like the color balance of the image. And I will say that these changes are best done at night where you can really see the fine differences. There we go, we've done one color adjustment. I can always go back to Instamask, click on maybe the blue color channel next, and then click on Brights 1. I can even adjust my sliders here for shadows, midtones, and highlights to add some contrast to the mask, which will just change how it targets the image. The brighter the parts of the photo, the more it will target those areas. The darker, the less it'll target those areas. Then I'll click on Select, go back up to my Adjustments tab and add another Levels Adjustment layer. And just like before, we can move our sliders around to change the color balance in the photo. 
And if you're not sure what color channel this is actually targeting, you can always go back to Instamask. And I can see here, since the blue dial was selected, this is blue. Therefore, we'll start off on blue instead. And with just these two adjustments, we've taken the image quite a long way. I could always go back to my adjustments layer, add a vibrance, and add a little bit more saturation. Then if I really want to tweak the colors a bit better, I'll hit Control Shift Alt E or Command Shift Option E if you're on a Mac. And then with this new layer, we'll go up to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. And this is a technique I actually picked up from my girlfriend who was really having a lot of fun with this. And what she does is she goes to the color grading option right here. That should bring up these three color wheels. And all you have to do is just move this around until you like the effect on the photo. The further you move this towards the edge, the more of a color cast there will be in your photos. So it takes a little bit of practice, but sometimes this can really transform the image. And if you go through and it looks kind of weird, you can always right click on the wheel and then reset it. And then I'll go back to where it was. You might want to do that anyway, just to see where you start off with. And I could say that's definitely a little bit too red for my liking. So maybe we'll go back to the shadows, make those a bit more blue, go to the midtones, maybe make those a little bit more cyan. That's starting to look pretty cool there. And then I'll hit OK. There's our before and after. Now we're starting to get some really nice color separation out of the photo. When originally, it was almost just completely red and kind of boring. So there we go. I can always add another saturation or vibrance layer if I feel it needs it. Maybe just add some vibrance in fact. Another thing I can do if I want to add some more texture to the image is hit Control Shift Alt E again to create another new composite layer. This time I'll go up to Filter, Camera Raw Filter, but rather than adjusting the colors, I'm going to adjust the texture and clarity under the Basic tab. And as I add more texture and clarity, I mean, it's really intense, but you can really start to see all these beautiful features. Then once I've added enough texture and clarity, I can scroll down to the Detail tab next. And inside of here, we've got Sharpening, Noise Reduction, and Color Noise Reduction. We've already run Noise Exterminator on the image, so we don't have to worry about that. We will increase the sharpening amount though. And as we increase the sharpening all the way to 150%, then we can adjust the radius until it's targeting the image properly. In this case, maybe around 2.6 or 2.7 for the radius. Same with the detail. We'll move this around until it's really targeting the image however we want to. And then finally, the masking. I just kind of move this left and right until it looks good to me. Then I lower the sharpening amount after I've done all that to something more reasonable. Maybe 100 or so. And then I'll hit OK. Here is now our before and after. And if we zoom in, you can see all these beautiful details that were kind of soft and fuzzy before. Now they're really starting to stand out nicely thanks to that texture and clarity as well as the sharpening in Camera Raw. Check this out right here. Pretty impressive, right? And this is mainly thanks to, again, Star Exterminator and Noise Exterminator, which cleaned up the grain and got all those stars out of our way. And I think this looks really pretty spectacular. So I'm gonna save this as Sadar Final for today, with the understanding that I might not like the colors tomorrow. So I will come back and take a look at this and put the final touches on it once I have a fresh look at the photo. And that's all I've got for you in today's processing tutorial. To wrap this whole video up, as you can see today, the ASI 533 does a really spectacular job for deep space astrophotography. And if you're looking for a fairly inexpensive monochrome camera, I think this is one of the best options out there. But that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in another video.